afternoon and thank you very much for this invitation to uh, share um, some of the experience that um, Twin and its partners have um, had working on smallholder groundnut value chains in Malawi. Um, the paper is in the book. Uh, these are the, the sections within the paper. There's, there's more detail, I hope, that you can find. But um, just to give you a little bit of an overview why we're concentrating on, on aflatoxin, um, there, there, there are sections on, on the health, um, but we're talking about four, at least 4.5 billion people at risk of chronic aflatoxin exposure. Um, as has been mentioned, um, it is in, it's involved in liver cancer um, and su suppression of the immune system. And um, stunting of children has also been mentioned. Children with aflatoxin have 30 to 40 percent more aflatoxin in their blood than children with normal body weight. And also, as has been mentioned, the Partnership for Af Aflatoxin Control in Africa um, is starting to address this across the continent. In the Malawi context, it, it's a rain-fed agricultural system. The crops are stressed either by drought or by floods. The frequency of, of droughts seems to be increasing. And the families store their crops for long periods of time. And um, particularly when they're short of food, um, <coughs> tend to eat food that you and I wouldn't um, consider suitable to eat. Last year, 1.6 million people um, needed food assistance. And there are 46% of the children under five who are stunted. So why groundnuts? Groundnuts are very nutritious. Many smallholders grow them, but very small quantities are grown. I'd just like to give you a little bit of an overview on TWIN, because we are talking about market interventions. TWIN has been working with smallholder farmers since 1985. Um, we are a charity, and we've got a for-profit trading arm, and we work uh, through trade, so by trading we identify where the constraints are in the, in the value chain. And we try to develop the sort of mutual relationship that David was talking about earlier. Um, primarily smallholder value chains and small, smallholder producer businesses. And increasingly working through partnerships and networks. We have a, a range of crops that we're looking at, uh, coffee, chocolate, fruit, but most recently, um, Liberation Food is a fair trade nut company, and Afronut in 2012 was established, and this is a peanut processing plant in Malawi. So this is an example of where we, we're working in European markets, but we're starting to work up the value chain. Um, and the reason I, I mentioned Twin's experience is we first came across aflatoxin in the 1990s when we were working on projects in Eritrea and the Gambia. And Twin's board looked very closely at whether we should be trading in nuts, particularly into Europe, because of the aflatoxin problem. We've um, decided to do that, and we are working on fair trade uh, nut supplies. And um, as you see, since 2004 through to 2013, we've been working on um, producing products that we can um, put onto the European market but more and more important to our work has been the focus on food safety in the value chain in Malawi. As was mentioned earlier, is aflatoxin a barrier to trade? Well, it, it affects 25% of the world's crops. But it isn't only a developing country issue. In Europe, there have been problems with milk um, and animal feed. And there are many entry points pre- and post-harvest, and one of them that I would like to focus on is hand shelling of ground nets. Each year, predominantly women spend four billion hours in Africa hand shelling peanuts. It's a very arduous, very painful process. People tend to wet the shells to make it easier to um, remove the shell by hand, 
and that introduces moisture, which is a precondition for, for the, the fungus. And then the storage is poor, which compounds the problem. And people aren't drying the crop to the level, 7% moisture is the level when the fungal growth stops. And when you're working in a formal chain, you're competing with the informal traders who don't take checks on aflatoxin. <coughs> So just coming back to the continent of, of Africa, um, in the 90s, 90% 90 of, of the export trade came from Africa. And it was a combination of macroeconomic, but also the increasingly tight aflatoxin regulations that drove the, the demise of, of that market. China, Argentina, and the US are now the largest um, exporters. But they have invested in value chains in a way that Africa hasn't. But there are questions about security of supply. So what happened to the groundnut production in Africa? Did it fall away? And how do we re-engage with the African market? Within this graph, the, the dark blue line, um, the African production did drop, but it didn't collapse. And it's starting to um, uh, rebound. Africa is the second largest producer of groundnuts. But it is consumed mainly in domestic and regional markets, and consumers are largely unaware of the aflatoxin problem. In Malawi, um, 40,000 tons per annum were exported to, to Europe. But by the 1990s, in, in fact, there's a dip just before, uh, before that, in the mid-80s, um, a dip in production. Um, the production and exports collapsed, but as you can see from, from the top graph, production is increasing very rapidly, but most of that is exported into local or regional markets. Very limited quantities are going um, into tight markets such as Europe. And on the bottom chart you can see that um, and less than 15% is exported. So the, the majority is consumed locally. And I will discuss a bit later, very little of that is wasted. So what we're looking at is the formal versus the informal value chain. So the advantages of a formal chain is that you can control it. You can protect the customer, whether it's for the export market or the local retail or, or other markets, such as the ready-to-use therapeutic food which can be produced locally. But within the informal value chains, improving quality, if done, would impact huge numbers of consumers. And I think this is a pre-competitive issue in that the value chains, the formal value chains, would benefit from improvements in the informal chain. But there's still little awareness of food safety or, or control for aflatoxin. There are few incentives for reduction of aflatoxin levels. There are things you can do, such as crushing contaminated uh, peanuts for oil and meal. Um, and they, those are relevant to both the formal and the informal sector. I want to give you some examples of um, aflatoxin levels in, in the food chain. Here you have um, some work done by ICRASAT in Malawi. And 43% of household food, uh, groundnuts, were above the uh, European level of four parts per billion. Um, and that ha increases as you go down the chain, which is a concern. Another piece of work done by ICRASAT, they were looking at um, 260 tons of groundnuts and what happened to, um, to the groundnuts as it went down the value chain. And one area that really is of concern, I think, is that less than 2% of that crop was um, sorted out. And 60% of that was used for food or feed. And the majority goes into flour. And in their t sampling, flour had the most contaminated uh, number of samples. We think we need to improve food value the food safety in all value chains, 
And the definition I've got at the top there is to do with food security. So it's when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. And I think one of the ways that we can view this is if we were to include food safety in the Sustainable Development Goals, and we took an approach similar to that for clean water or sanitation, then I think we'd be moving in the right direction. So looking to introduce inf interventions at critical control points, as we do in the formal chain. Um, but we do need a paradigm shift in the way that we think about this. We need to be looking at how we pull unsafe groundnuts and other grains out of the hu human food chain and develop pro profitable alternatives, such as oil and meal. Um, and this will require improved infrastructure, awareness and standards. It will require us to work in partnerships. And I'm pleased to say that in Malawi, there is now a Malawi partnership for aphitoxin control. It has been established and it's aligned to, to PACA. Um, formal value chains are required, such as um, the Akhenbatu example that I, I mentioned. And we need to move from these poor practices, this poor storage, poor shelling, poor sorting, to a more uh, rigorous um, method. The further investments up the value chain, closer to the farmers, are needed. We think food safety is a pre-competitive issue, and that paradigm shift requires agriculture, health, nutrition, and value chain experts working together. So we're saying that we need to raise awareness of the public health issues, improve the post-harvest practices and pre-harvest, provide, provide appropriate training and equipment, um, but I do think we need to pull aphitoxin out of the human food chain. Thank you very much.